When you run a bivariate regression using SPSS, you get several tables of output. The first table provides descriptive statistics for each variable in the regression. On average, people paid $5.92 for the album, and their weekly disposable income was $108.09. The second table of output is a correlation matrix. As we only have two variables in our regression, there's only one correlation coefficient reported here. 0.517, and that's statistically significant. The third table is called variables entered and removed. This table provides a summary of the variables in the bivariate regression. We can see here that just one predictive variable was entered into the regression, weekly disposable income, and that the criterion variable is price paid for the album. In the model summary table, there's a, a few different figures of interest. The first is R squared, which indicates the proportion of variance in the criterion accounted for by the predictive variable. In this case, disposable income can account for 26.7% of the variance in prices that people paid for the album. By extension then, this leaves 73.3% of the variance in prices paid unaccounted for. It's possible that by including additional variables in this regression model, we could improve its predictive utility. And this is illustrated using standard regression and hierarchical regression in StatHand. Now R squared is a sample statistic and it tends to overestimate the true population effect. Consequently, it's recommended that you also report adjusted R squared, which is said to be a better estimate of the proportion of variance in price paid that you could expect would be accounted for by disposable income in the population from which we've sampled. Here, the difference between the two figures is quite small anyway. Now, part of the purpose of regression is to build a model that can be used to make predictions. In this case, the model contains just one variable, weekly disposable income, and that's being used to predict the prices that customers paid for the album. Because the model is not perfect, and we already know that disposable income can't account for all of the variance in prices paid, then any predictions made with it will be off or inaccurate to some degree. The standard error of estimate is a measure of how much we'd expect predictions to be off on average. So on average, we would expect any predictions made using this model to be off on average by $2.91. Now the ANOVA table reports the null hypothesis significance test for R squared. The null hypothesis for this test is that R squared does not depart from zero. And here we can reject this null hypothesis because the significance value is less than alpha, which we would typically set at 0.05. So in other words, R squared departs significantly from zero. In the coefficients table, there are quite a few figures, although I'm not going to explain them all. Firstly, the constant is 2.616. This is the value that we would predict for the criterion, price paid, when the predictor, disposable income, is zero. Now, you should be wary about interpreting this value if you haven't sampled around zero. And this is the case in this example. Everybody in our sample had at least $10 of disposable income each week. The unstandardized regression coefficient, or B, for disposable income is 0.031. For each unit, or dollar increase in weekly disposable income, we would predict a corresponding 0.031 dollar, or if you like, 3.1 cent increase in the price a customer is willing to pay for the album. The corresponding t-test tells us that this regression coefficient departs significantly from zero. In other words, it's a significant predictor. It has predictive utility. Now the confidence interval around this unstandardized regression coefficient stretches from 0.018 to 0.043. So from 1.8 cents to 4.3 cents. Beta, or the standardized regression coefficient for disposable income is 0.517. And this tells us that for every standard deviation increase in weekly disposable income, we would predict a 0.517 standard deviation increase in price paid. Now we'll skip over the residual statistics table and look at the charts. 
and these charts are used to assess the regression assumptions of normality, linearity, and homoscedasticity of residuals. Now, the normality of residuals assumption can be assessed by looking at this histogram, and this plots the standardized residuals from smallest to largest. If this histogram conforms reasonably well to the normal distribution overlaid on top of it, as it does here, then we can conclude that the normality of residuals assumption has been met. Now, normality of residuals can also be assessed by looking at this normal PP plot of regression standardized residuals. Here, the normal distribution is represented by the diagonal line. The points on this plot should hug the line as closely as possible. Now, the last chart is a plot of standardized residuals against standardized predicted values, and it can be used to assess the assumptions of linearity and homoscedasticity of residuals. For a technical description of exactly what's being plotted here, please refer to some of the references in the StatHand app or website. For our purposes, if the distribution of points is roughly linear, so it's better captured by a straight line than anything else, we can conclude that the assumption of linearity of residuals has been met. Furthermore, if there's roughly the same amount of variability in the size of the residuals at all predicted values, then we can say that the assumption of homoscedasticity of residuals has been met. Now, putting aside the assumptions, which you can learn more about in StatHand, this is how you might summarize the results of these analyses. So bivariate regression indicated that weekly disposable income could account for a significant 26.7% of the variance in prices paid for the album.